Hello. Welcome back from lunch and from a lot of deep talks this morning. Um, I think it's time for another keynote. Um, I don't know about you, but I think uh, that this is just the perfect time to take a deep breath. And um, there's really nothing better to think about when we take a deep breath than focus at an event like this because uh, you probably have at least one idea from every session that you want to just go run off and, and hack on, certainly this morning. So um, does everybody here have an iPhone? Do we have at least one iPhone per person in the room? No, 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 Louis does. Well, you, Louis, speak for yourself. So there's probably, actually, when we were planning Wi-Fi here, we were planning for three devices per person on average. And they said, yeah, no problem, because they'd have other events here with that. So three events. Th then we probably have 600 iDevices in the room. Although, actually, the MacBooks, they don't have an i in their name. So last summer, I was at the Computer History Museum. And I saw the person who put the eye in the iPhone. And when we heard his story, we thought, this person needs to be at Renaissance. We need to talk to him. And that's who I'm going to introduce to you today. This is Ken Segal. Ken worked for um, almost 14 years with Steve Jobs at Next and at Apple. Um, but as an advertiser from the outside, from a consulting firm, from Sade. Shy it. Sade, I, I can never say that right. So we'll just turn this over to Ken. And Ken has a book called Insanely Simple mm -hmm. and a blog all about simplicity. And I guess I really should have said simplify it, but um, I was stubborn and called it focus it. And anyway, let me get out of the way and introduce Ken and let him tell us his story and lessons about focus. Thanks, Ken. My pleasure. <laughs> Uh, hi. Um, see if I get myself situated here. Uh, I'm really excited to come here for two reasons, actually. Uh, one, I'm an Apple fan, obviously. Um, and you guys are the guys who tend to make all this stuff happen, so it's really interesting for me to come talk to you. And the second thing is that some among you, somebody owes me 2,000 bucks, and I want it back. Um, my son has been charging all these in-app purchases, and I just caught him. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> so talk amongst yourselves, and I'll, I'd like to pick up a check before I leave. Um, so I, I do have a, a simple story. My thing is about simplicity. And um, I worked with uh, Steve when he came back to, uh, to Apple in 1997 after his 11 years in exile. I was the creative director at Chiat Day, which is the ad agency. And we did the Think Different campaign and all that stuff. Um, but I actually worked with Steve for eight years at Next, so I had an interesting point of view, seeing the struggling Steve um, before I got to see the super successful Steve. And uh, I also had the pleasure, sometimes pleasure, oftentimes agony, of working with, um, hello, these guys. <clears throat> Intel and Dell in particular, I hope I don't offend anybody here, but. Um, I had a very, very frustrating time in those places. And uh, it actually taught me quite a few lessons and got me thinking about the extreme differences between the way Apple works and the way all these other companies work. And that's actually what led me to write my book, Insanely Simple, which is about this principle that has driven so many different things that Apple has done. But before we get going, I'm doing something that's never been tried on stage before, by me, anyway. Um, I happen to have one copy of my book. I'd like to lighten my load before I leave. So I've got a quiz here for you, uh, just as a little warm up. Um, and we can't have a free for all. You have to raise your hands and be called upon. But somebody's going to get a copy of the book for, for getting the answer right. I'm going to give you five names that were considered. You may recall that when the iPhone came out, there was some problem with Cisco owning the name iPhone. And, uh, inside Apple every other day, it was like, it's on, it's off, it's on, it's off. And there were other names considered to be the iPhone. And if you can identify the name of these five that was not considered, I'll give you a book. But you have to raise your hand and be called upon. So the first name is Moby, for mobile. Kind of lame, but could have been. Tripod. I mean, it had uh, a phone, uh, internet, and uh, iPod in there, so why not? I ring. I mean, you're making calls with it. You ring somebody. That's possible. Telepod, like that one. 
a telephone and an iPod. And then last, iPad. There was no iPad at the time. Maybe, possibly, they were considering that to be the name of the iPhone. So which of these names was not a consideration? You in the black shirt there. Yes, you. Number three. Number three? Damn, he got it. <laughs> uh, I know you guys are really smart, so I was assuming we weren't going to go beyond five guesses. But, uh, but one is very, very good. So when we're done, I'll give you one. Just come. Uh, Anyway, so Apple's great story started in 1997. I mean, obvious, obviously great things happened before that. But uh, when Steve came back from exile is when all the magic started. And Wired magazine ran this famous cover, which captured everyone's uh, feeling that creativity was on the line. When Apple dies, the world will be a, a less creative place, and we're all supposed to pray for Apple. But a mere 14 years later, Apple was, uh, Apple was near bankruptcy when Steve came back. He said they were 90 days from bankruptcy. 14 years later, the most valuable company on earth. Although in recent months, the, uh, they're in danger of losing <laughs> that title. And my vast fortune is going along with it because I bought a lot of Apple stock. Um, but anyway, it's kind of remarkable. I mean, never, that's, never before in history has a company gone from bankruptcy, near bankruptcy, to most valuable company on earth. Um, and I believe it's because of... Uh, this thing called simplicity. And over my years working with Steve, I just saw him, uh, he looked at everything through this lens. It wasn't just the products they were designing. It was uh, the way the company was organized, the way they advertised, the way they set up the retail stores. Everything he did, he, se he seemed to just have this thing about making things simpler. Um, and we should actually start talking about it in terms of focus, so it appears to be compatible with what you're here to discuss. It's just a surface thing, however. Um, anyway, so Apple has a thing about simplicity, and this is like my poster child for it. Um, this is a product thing. It's the way they approach products. But again, it's this same philosophy that uh, Steve certainly had when he approached anything. He was really concerned that something would be pleasing to the eye, obvious in its use, um, and, it and you would focus all of its uh, features into some easy-to-handle thing. So when we came back, when he came back to Apple, we did this commercial, Think Different, and it started the campaign. One reason we did that commercial is because we had no computers to talk about. It was going to be a good six or eight months before we had anything to talk about. They were working on the iMac, but we had no idea what it was going to look like. And Steve said, trust me, it's going to be great. Um, so just pretend that good things are coming, because they are. And we have to tell the world why Apple, that Apple is alive and well and uh, stands for something special. So we did this Think Different campaign, and you may be familiar with the, um, the, with the commercial, Here's to the Crazy Ones. Uh, Steve had a lot to do with the development of that commercial. He was very, very vested in the words, um, and he really loved them. Ten years after the commercial ran, he was still running it at Macworld Show when he gave his speeches there. Um, I was pretty amazed when I went to that one and saw that he was still running it. But he really did have this affection for it. And we thought, uh, Steve, you love this commercial so much and it's so important to you, you should read the, read the words to it. He resisted. He didn't want it to be a distraction. He didn't want his voice to be a distraction. He thought the words were really important. So, but, but we strong-armed him, and, and strong-arming strong Steve, that's a good one. But... Um, we begged him, <laughs> that's more appropriate, uh, and I flew up to Apple one day with our sound guy from the agency in LA and we recorded Steve. He walked into the room and he said, uh, I'm having a really bad day, I've got no time for this, I don't think it's a good idea in the first place, I'll give you one take and I'm out of here. So he actually did three takes, it was uh, kind of a major coup, and then when we had our big night where we tried to talk him into it, he just wouldn't budge. He said. I want people to listen to the commercial and not worry about who's reading it. So we used our uh, read of Richard Dreyfus. Afterwards, if anyone's interested, I have an amusing story about um, Phyllis Diller, who we also had read the commercial, at Steve's request, amazingly, because she was playing the queen ant role in Bugs, Bugs Life at, the, at that time, and he thought she had an interesting voice. And it was one of the worst experiences of my life. She was terrible. Um, <laughs> but we did do that. Anyway, so Steve... 
re, uh, refused to be the voice, and we used Richard Dreyfus, and uh, the rest is history. Another thing we did at the very beginning was this thing, which is uh, another um, example of simplicity. Um, and yes, I was one of the conspirators behind this. So we had the name iMac, and then of course from there, all these other i things happened. And really, it's one of those things that, um, I mean, you know that Steve was looking for something simple, but you know, the obvious doesn't always jump out at you. Right now, it seems extremely obvious. The idea of the computer was that it gets you on the internet quickly, easily. So it's a Macintosh, it gets you on the internet. iMac wasn't really that difficult. Yet we filled walls with ideas. And Steve said, um, when he gave us the assignment, I have a, a, a name that I really, really like, and you guys got two weeks to beat it. Um, I'm not sure some of you might have heard this story before, but if you have, just do your email or something for a second. Um, <clears throat> Steve had this, this notion that the iMac should be called Mac-Man. <laughs> and it's, it's the truth. And I say it with like, sort of like a you know, fond memory because I think Steve was like the most incredible genius, certainly the most incredible person I ever worked with. I have more respect for him than anyone I've ever met in my life. But he was human and he had a few, you know, faults, he made a few mistakes in his day, and there was one of them. Uh, <laughs> he thought that if it sounded a little bit like Sony, like, what the heck, they're a good company, and, and maybe a little rub-off wouldn't be a bad idea, that's the way he said it. But he gave us these instructions, and he said, uh, it's got this big handle on the top, but it weighs a ton. It's really just there to help you get it from one room to the next. So I don't want you to do anything that would make it seem like it's portable, because it really isn't. So we're sitting there saying, well, uh, Mac-Man sounds like Walkman, which is the world's most portable electronic device at the time. That didn't make sense. And then he said, it looks very toy-like too, so I don't want the name to make it be too much of a toy because it's a Macintosh, it's a real computer. So again, we're thinking like Mac-Man sounds like Pac-Man. So what is it exactly that you like about this name? <laughs> and, uh, but again, smart as you may be, uh, and as smart as Steve, was he was a human being, and sometimes you just like something, and no amount of logic is going to talk you out of it. So we tried to talk him out of it, and he wouldn't budge. And the only way to, to win is to show him something better. So we did come back a week later, and we had iMac and four other names. And the other names, I, you're probably thinking right now, hey, this guy's pretty good at naming. Um, iMac was pretty good, but when I tell you the other names, you know, your opinion will go right down again. But we had Max, Maxter, Mac Rocket. Uh, things like that, that were pretty lame by our own standards and Steve's. And we showed him these things, and it was hate it, hate it, hate it. And then we were so sure we would win with iMac, and he hated that as well. So he gave us a week to come back and better that. We came back with a few new names. He didn't like any of those. And then with a faint glimmer of hope, I pulled iMac out of the bag again. We still like this one. And uh, he thought about it for a moment this time. He said, well, I don't hate it this week, but I don't like it either. So now you've got two days to, to do better. And um, I always wish I had a good ending for this story, and I don't. <laughs> um, a couple of days later, I'm talking to somebody at Apple inside, and they said, hey, did you hear Steve had the name silkscreen on the computer? He's showing it around. He's getting good reactions. And I never heard another peep. We never got the official phone call, you know, bless your little hearts or anything like that. Um, suddenly, it was just called iMac. Um, and it's a good thing, by the way, too, because uh, if we didn't persevere as we did, you'd be sitting there now with your phone mans and your pod mans. <clears throat> uh, OK, so simplicity is a really good thing. My first, uh, my first mission here is to convince you that simplicity is a good thing, just in case you didn't already believe that. There are some things in the world that catch my eye, and this is one. I saw this in Grand, uh, Times Square over the summer. Um, I think it's a current. Actually, I just saw a poster recently for it, too. I'm not sure if this is a permanent thing or a promotional thing with McDonald's, but any cup of coffee, any size, $1. And I don't go to McDonald's. I don't drink coffee. But yet this poster on the bus made me like the company, and I thought that was an interesting example of the power of simplicity to help you be loved. Um, I should also point out in passing, this is all stream of consciousness, um, 
Steve had this, re, this thing that he would say quite often, that our mission is to get Apple, get our customers to love Apple. That's the whole mission. Everything we do, we want them to love us. And when people love your brand, good things will happen. So this is an example of, of something McDonald's was doing to get people to actually feel good about them. Um, it just, you know, probably doesn't cost them, you know, just pennies to make a different, you know, this size versus that size. But it causes all this goodwill, and you're in there, and you're obviously buying more stuff and filling yourself with really bad food. So everyone's happy. Another unlikely hero is the post office, who came out with the forever stamp some number of years ago. Now, I don't know about you guys, and I don't know why I'm so proud to be such a cheapskate, but at home I have an envelope with all the little denominations of stamps that I've saved over the years, 8s, 11s, 19s, 31s. And I guess somewhere there's this hope inside that one day I'll hobble together the magic combination to be able to mail a letter. Um, <clears throat> and I never do that, and, and, and don't even ask me why. It's another human failure, I suppose, but um, I'm afraid to kind of go over. I don't want to, like, overpay. So, you know, if I don't want the, my total of stamps to be 48 cents when I only need 44. Oh, boy, I got some problems. But anyway... <laughs> How great is it that you can now buy a stamp and it'll never go out of date? One stamp, you can mail a letter you know, 30 years from now and they'll still honor it. You like the post office for doing that. And they have another thing now where anything you can cram into the one box, no weighing or anything like that, if it fits in the box, it's 10 bucks. Those are the kind of things that make you like the people making the offer. So it, it, it has this instant likability quotient and that's one of the great effects of simplicity. Another great thing about simplicity is that it absolutely never fails. It's one thing in this world that is foolproof, and that is because um, simplicity is not a trend. It's been around for absolutely ever. You can go to your local Barnes & Noble and go to the business management section or whatever, and they're just like, all the books are trends. They, you know, they come and they go. Except, of course, Insanely Simple, which is an instant classic and will be there forever. Uh, <clears throat> Just kidding, I, I can't even find it in Barnes & Noble anymore. It's quite humiliating. I'm waiting to see it as I go uh, through the garage sale rounds this summer for 25 cents. It'll be really hurtful. Um, anyway, so it's not a trend, and it's burnt into the wiring of every living thing, not just human beings. I would suggest that um, animals, it's just a, a, a natural reaction. If you put a bone in front of a dog, five feet in front of a dog, and another one up a flight of stairs, obviously he's going to take the one that's right in front of him. It's just an instinctive response, and it's undeniable. Nobody can, can argue it. It's a universal preference. So I think this is the thing that Steve just, he didn't say these things aloud, but he obviously believed these things. He saw everything through this lens of simplicity, um, and he, he just learned to focus so incredibly well. The bad news is that for every good thing in this world, um, there's a, an equal and opposite bad thing. And in this case, it's this whole idea of complexity. And no matter what we do, no matter what you do, no matter how, many, how skilled you are at what you do, I can guarantee there are 10 people around you who are going to try to screw it up for you. And they may not be people you work with, but people you meet or whatever. You'll be, there are things that complicate your life. There are meetings. There are too many meetings. There, there are meetings that are too overpopulated, their current events change your plans, a competitor will do something and change your plans, and how you deal with all these things determines how focused you remain from the beginning to the end of your, of your project. And uh, therefore, being simple is not simple, and someone like Steve Jobs succeeded not just because he believed in simplicity, but because he was a ruthless um, slayer of complexity. And by the way, that was one of the fun things about working with them, because how many times are you sitting in a meeting with people and someone says something dumb or the meeting starts to go the wrong way or whatever? If you had Steve Jobs' kind of nerve, you would say something, but most of us are pretty nice and we just maybe sort of cajole our way through the meeting. But Steve didn't have those kinds of social graces, so it was really fun because you always wished somebody would, would really crush that person and he would do it for you. And <laughs> provide moments of amusement and while he kept things in line. Simplicity, in my mind, is the combination of brains and common sense. And I think we all work with a lot of smart people. I think there are a ton of smart companies out there. Um, in fact, any company that's a big company that is profitable in this world, global company or whatever, obviously is smart. It takes smart people to do these things. But common sense 
is a thing, again, that drove Steve, and it was a pleasure to watch uh, day to day because some things, just, you know, decision A versus decision B, clearly B is the better way. In some other companies, they might say, well, that'll take an extra week or an extra million dollars or whatever the reason is. Steve didn't care about those things. He wanted to do the right thing, um, not just for the customer experience, but just because logically, common sense said something was a better way to go. And my favorite example of this, it's a bit old right now, but iTunes um, and iPod, uh, Apple, as you know, created this digital music revolution. And they did st something that was very simple. 99 cents a song, if you bought five songs, it'd be about five bucks. You'd pay your five bucks by your credit card, you'd have a zero balance. What could be simpler? Well, if you're another company who's prepared to do battle with someone who owns like 80% of the market as Microsoft uh, wanted to, Microsoft wanted to do battle with Apple and created the Zune player and they created the Zune marketplace for music, um, you need to have something better um, and common sense should be your guide. Uh, but Microsoft, instead of having you pay with money, had you pay with Microsoft points, uh, which is something they created for Xbox and I believe it still exists today. However, um, the common sense part of it is a little bit odd. 80 points equals a dollar, uh, and you'd have to buy them in lots of 100 or whatever, so you get 800 points for 10 bucks. Uh, that's simple. And they'd say, one, so one song costs you 79 points. And of course, like, well, what do I want to do? Pay Apple 99 cents or Apple or Microsoft 79 points? Sounds cheaper. Well, obviously, it wasn't. If you do the math, it's 79 points is 99 cents. So right there, there's that kind of you're trying to fool me thing, which instantly turns people off. And remember, your job is to make people love you. Um, people aren't going to love that. It just sounds ridiculous. Uh, so in their, in their case, you'd have to pay 395 points. You'd have a balance of 405 points when you were done. Uh, and it's just kind of silly. I can guarantee you, if anyone proposed that system to Steve Jobs, um, it wouldn't have been pretty. It would have been, actually, would have been one of those fun moments to watch him disassemble them. <laughs> um, we didn't exactly try this out before, but I'm going to play you a little video right now, and hopefully the sound won't uh, split your eardrums when it comes on. Be prepared, fellas. Um, this is Steve Jobs when he was 25 years old, talking about why he named Apple, Apple. We examined it on a regular basis, and we found that the juxtaposition of something that seemed to epitomize what we were going after, which was the simplicity and yet very refined sophistication. I've seen our first brochure, probably some of you have it, the title of it was Simplicity is the Ultimate Sophistication. And that wasn't just a, a bullshit slogan, it actually was really what we've been striving for. And uh, the apple seemed to symbolize that. So I think we're going to stick with it. <laughs> I should have warned you in advance there was a bad glitch in there, but you could. Uh, this was something from the Computer History Museum, and it, it, much of the tape is unwatchable, but that little bit is good. But what I like about it is this thing about simplicity being the ultimate sophistication. And this is the first computer, the first mass computer that Apple ever created. It was like 79 or something. Um, Simplicity is the ultimate sophistication, and of course you could put that headline on anything they've made since. You could put that above the iPad and it would make perfect sense. And the most important point about this is that a lot of people think of simplicity as a dumbing down of something, when that is not at all the, the way Apple sees it. Simplifying something is really the ultimate uh, advanced technology. It's, it is the most sophisticated thing you could do to take advanced capabilities and put them in a format that ordinary people can use without even thinking. So simplicity to some people is a negative, but it's really, really a good thing. So in my book, um, and one person in the audience will come to know this, uh, and we're going to keep it from the rest of you because you didn't buy the book and now you'll have to suffer. Um, it's about thinking, uh, there were like 10 chapters about different kinds of simplicity. And thinking minimal is really the most important one. And again, in your case here, 
Um, it's about focus. It's about extreme focus. Um, and I think Apple has been incredibly good about minimizing things. Uh, Steve said this thing about Apple having no committees. This was in, nine, in 2010 he said this, um, that Apple in effect runs like the world's biggest startup. And this was the huge difference between Intel and Dell on one side and Apple on the other. Those other companies run like really big companies and they are unable to focus like Apple focuses. Um, the examples are, are quite a few and we can talk about them afterwards. We're gonna have a little bit of a discussion here. Um, <clears throat> but, but the way Steve thought, really the, the, the best way to become a big company is not to act like one. So he wouldn't bog things down in committees uh, and he would have small groups of smart people doing everything. He didn't have tons of people working on things and we did this at the ad agency too. We'd have a small group of smart people and we would interact with Steve's small group of smart people and we did okay. I think Steve had this kind of childlike idealism uh, that a lot of people would have frowned upon, um, ha again, had they not seen his success, when he, it was kind of like, hey, let's start a company and let's just run it like this because that's a cool way to run it. And I think the IBMs of the world would look at that and frown, but again, Steve did that and proved that it's actually a better way to go. It's about uh, holding on to what you, what you had at the beginning. Every company starts as a startup and every company is simpler when it starts. Steve held on to something that he always had, whereas a lot of these companies are just big and huge and they lost what they had at the beginning along the way. Minimizing the product line is another good one too. Um, this probably isn't something that developers run up against because your apps are so different and they all exist for a reason, but there might be something in here you can pull out of it and use for your benefit. But it's my favorite example because it's so extreme. If, you go, if you're looking for a laptop, for example, and you go to Dell's website, um, you would see that they have quite a few to choose from. Um, <clears throat> that many. 42, and I'm not kidding, I, I did this research myself. It took me a couple of hours, but you have to go to so many different pages to find all their offerings. There's business and consumer and education and government and all these things, and each one has a different model number and a different set of specs. I didn't do a whole lot of comparing because I was getting too dizzy, but I mean really, uh, some of them are screen sizes, but not all of them because some of the numbers don't indicate screens, you know, the 6600 versus the 6700 and things like that. And again, food for another conversation, but the naming is kind of insane as well. I mean, uh, you know, everything in the Apple world is a Mac this or an i that and you know instantly what company it came from and everything, everything they produce builds upon the same foundation and makes them stronger, whereas these guys, every time they have a new idea, they give it another name and it has nothing to do with anything. But I digress. What about HP? Um, could they do a better job than, than Dell? And the answer is absolutely. <laughs> They've got 49. <clears throat> and I love some of these names too. You know, you've got the, N and I'm taking the capitalization, by the way, right off of their site. You know, Envy is in caps. You've got Sleek books, quad editions, energy stars, touch smarts, uh, BV6Ts. I really, you, I mean, you know, no human being could really know what that's all about. Um, and then, of course, you go to Apple's site, and they've got basically six models. And I'm actually being kind because I don't consider the Retina display really like a whole different model, but some people do, so let's call it a model and say that there are six of them. But still, six versus 42 versus 49. It's a bit of a difference. So the big question is, does anybody ever leave? Uh, let me start that over again. When I worked with Dell, I would ask many people there, like, explain why you do this again. Why do you have to have all these models? And you get all these different answers from different people about choice and corporate customers want this or that. Um, that's called product proliferation, when you just keep adding things and it gets more and more complicated. Does anyone leave Apple's site or Apple store feeling like they had a lack of choice? I think not, because basically you buy, you get the super slim one or the full featured one and then you put the things in it that you want. And actually the little dirty secret at, at Apple is that if you multiplied out all those options, you actually get to 40 or 50 different models. So the moral of the story and one that perhaps you could use is it's all in the presentation. Apple technically makes probably as many models as those other guys, but you would never know it by looking. You go to their site, it's an easy, easy choice. 
And that's one of those things that makes people love the brand more. Like, wow, that was so simple. I went in and I bought a computer and I'm happy with it. If you agonize over a decision with Dell or Intel, excuse me, Dell or HP, it's probably like buying a car is for some people where you, you wonder for several weeks whether you really bought the right one. That kind of thing doesn't exist in the Apple world, although it actually did. When Steve came back in 1997, there were 20 some odd distinct product models. Um, all of them hideous, by the way. Um, E-mates and cameras and printers, and message pads, Newtons, um, power books, all that stuff. And remember, Apple was losing money every quarter, so Steve came along and, and had to deal with that. So it was in um, 1998 when he unveiled the iMac, um, and that presentation is widely considered hugely important because he showed the direction of the company with iMac. But a more important thing, I think, is that he put this grid on the wall. Um, and he said, we're blowing up our entire product line. No more 20 some odd models. We're gonna make four things and four things only. We're gonna have a, a home version and a pro version of a desktop and a laptop. And today, I showed you iMac. We have a Power Mac, which is the uh, pro version. Power Book for pros, uh, portable. And Mr. Secrecy stood there and said, next up is a home version of a laptop. So he, he made no secret of the fact that that was coming. Another thing that is seriously in need of, word of, of, in need of minimization is the words you use. And this is something everyone can benefit from because I spend my life as a word-obsessed person. Every billboard I see, every ad I see, I start striking out in my mind all the unnecessary words. But, and it's talking like a human being too. It's, it's avoiding the trap of all the technical talk. So, for example, when Apple came out with the iPod, it wasn't, you know, scroll wheel, five gigabytes, firewire port. It was really just a thousand songs in your pocket, something that human beings could relate to. And, of course, if you went to the site or read the ads deep enough, you would see those other things, but that wasn't how they drew people in. So Leonardo da Vinci is credited with saying this. Personally, I find that hard to believe. I didn't know he spoke English, but um, <laughs> one... One should use common words to explain uncommon things. And whoever said it, I love the sentiment, and I think Apple is particularly good about doing this. Um, and then while we're on the topic, I have one amusing thing. I just found this in my email archives. Once in a while I go through, and I'm bored and have nothing else to do, but I found this little email exchange between me and Steve. And it had to do with um, this. We were running... Uh, a billboard with five multicolored iMacs, and the headline was The Internet Express, and it would, it would be on the freeway. And once we put it together, I think Steve had suggested that we remove the the. This, this is the level of conversation we used to have. Should there be a the or no the? So Steve said, I think it should just be Internet Express. And then, and we accepted that, but then when we put it together, for some reason, we felt like it should be the. Um, so I sent him this note. Um, and asked him, you know, told him we were thinking we'd like to stick the the back in there and asked if he had any passionate feeling on this one. And his answer was, fine, you know me, always go with the majority is my motto. <laughs> so he did have a sense of humor. Um, two things that are worth noting here as well as we kind of take a little forensic journey into this email. One is that Steve used his Pixar email address, and this was 1999. This is two years, December 99. So this is two full years into our relationship after Think Different started. Um, and Steve was still using his Pixar address. He, he was very attached to that, so it's just a point of curiosity. At the same time, you would be interested to note that he did not use a Mac. His computer of choice was a Toshiba laptop running Next Step. He was really attached to the Next OS, and um, he only when OS X came out did he convert and actually use a Mac. So put that in your pipe and smoke it. Um, the summary comment here is, uh, <laughs> I'm really bad with the quotes. Some French guy said, um, perfection is achieved not when there's nothing left to add, but when there's nothing left to remove. And I think this is a really important thing that Steve believed in deeply. He would actually speak about how Apple believed in uh, peeling away the layers of the onion to get at something that was really, really special, that you could get to a great product, anybody could, could come up with a great product, 
but it was the starting point for Apple to peel away those layers of the onion and get at something really, really wonderful inside. So simplicity is the ultimate competitive weapon. Um, I think in a complicated world, uh, simplicity just sticks out. People notice it and they like it. It's a natural human thing to prefer the simpler path. Um, so it's as if, if, you're, if the world is blue and you have something red, you'll be noticed. So uh, dumb analogy actually, because simplicity is a thing you really, really desire, whereas color is arbitrary. So forget I said that. But this great quote from Steve, uh, it's my favorite, that simple can be harder than complex. You have to work hard to get your thinking clean to make it simple. But it's worth it in the end because when you get there, you can move mountains. And if Joe Blow just said that passing you by in the street, you might say, thanks, appreciate the thought. But this is a guy who created the world's most profitable company from uh, most valuable company from something that was near bankruptcy and did it in 14 years, and I believe that that is actually the uh, biggest reason why. Um, if anyone's interested, I do have a blog, and we, we have these fun conversations, and you can follow me on Twitter. But, and this is another special iOS-only uh, performance, I think I have time. Um, has anyone here ever heard of Scupertina? Oh, come on, this happens. Scupertino? Huh? Oh, well, kind of, yes. Good, good. <laughs> if I had a book, I'd give you one. What? Yes, fake Apple news. Well, this is my little alter ego. My, I do it with a, um, with a former Apple designer, uh, agency designer on Apple. So we're both very, very skilled in Apple ads. We can recreate things that look pretty realistic. Um, and we just started this thing. It's like kind of like the onion for Apple people. And by the way, I'm, I'm, I've been talking all around the world, and I always ask, has anyone heard of Scupertino? And I get three or four hands. Scupertino is, uh, is thousands of times more popular than my blog. <laughs> um, we've got over four million visits in just like two and a half years. Um, so somebody's, at, somebody's looking, um, and you might want to join the party. But I'm just going to show you a couple of little things we did, because really, we have fun. We've created this world where Apple's values have gone amok. Um, and we like to pretend that we believe what so many of the critics believe, that Apple is out to take all your money or to control the world, Steve Jobs is evil, all that kind of stuff. But we have fun with it. And we get a lot of Apple haters visiting, but we get a lot more Apple lovers visiting. So you might have seen some of these things, because a lot of them go viral, but this was a, a fake product we made, Apple Water. Um, and you'll note here that... Uh, Molecular perfection, literally twice as many hydrogen atoms as there are oxygen atoms. <laughs> um, so Apple always takes credit for things other people really did, right? So, um, so that's kind of fun. Um, and then, of course, we did the, fake, the ad that went with that. This is in the article. We have uh, the Apple Water ad. Um, you've got Apple on the outside. Now get it on the inside. If you're a fanboy, no other water will do. Um, and then, of course, there was Apple Water Pro. <laughs> uh, you'll also recall that when the uh, iPhone came out and there was a, the antenna gate controversy, you know, if you held, you and your damn fleshy hands would, would cause the uh, signal to, to, you know, go bad and you'd drop your calls and everything else. So that was a problem. If you're a human being, the iPhone 4 was obviously a curse. So we came up with the eye hand, which um, was a a wooden hand that you could use to hold your iPhone, and you would hold that. So we had, and by the way, this is all before Steve died, so it was in good taste, but, you know, Steve was sporting his eye hand there, and we had the uh, different races here. We had eye hand Kermit down here at the bottom. And if you'll note also the telescope, I think I'm telescoping thing here attached, so you could actually raise it. You could either, you know, find an, a comfortable level for your own ear or hold it to the ear of a colleague, perhaps, like this. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, um, and then this is another one that was in good taste at the time, but um, like all the Jesus sightings you see around the world, but um, this farmer in Chile had discovered, you know, one morning his wife made him the toast, and there was Steve Jobs on his toast, and it turns out, of course, that it had healing powers, and people started lining up to get their iPhones fixed, and they holding their iMacs and everything else. Uh, and then last, this, this, we, we have like kind of a tally that runs there about the most popular story. This one um, has got like hundreds of thousands of views, and I can't really explain some of these things, but I just added it today. Um, 
it's a USB thing that's a pipe. Um, you know, it's got all kinds of good features. The perfect high from the company that knows high best. Um, and turn your workspace into a Turkish pothouse. I don't know. Uh, so you're invited to visit Scupertino. We put up a, a sometimes we relate to, Cooper, uh, to current events also. This week's story is about Tim Cook appearing on Oprah to confess the doping scandal that's going on at Apple. That um, turns out they've been taking creative growth hormones all these times, and that's how they've created all these things. And uh, Microsoft is feeling very good now because at last the playing field will be evened up, and fairly soon Apple will be making just as cheesy products as they do. Um, anyway, so that's it for me, and uh, thanks for being a good audience. <laughs> Well, you're not really leaving because oh, we have some questions to ask. Questions first. Um, so I, I want to know, what did you actually put on that sign? Was it the internet or internet? When he went along with it, we took, we left the the in. You know, I, I have the proof of it at home, but I, I scoured the internet. It's one of those things. Sometimes you actually Google something and can't find it. I'm shocked that it doesn't ex exist somewhere. So I had to scan it or something to get it in. I just haven't done that yet. So? So didn't you feel like he was setting you up to go out and, you know, make a mistake so he could say, I told you so? No, not really. And really, my favorite times with Steve were those one-on-one -on -one conversations, like late at night sometimes where we'd go over the... You know, back in those days, a lot of it was big inserts, long copy, and um, there were just a lot of things, and Steve would want to go through, and we'd have these conversations about, you know, should this be a the or an a, you know, stuff like that. and. Um, Quite fascinating to have that alone time with a guy. He's, he's very, very smart. He knew a lot about language and words, and he, and he knew about the subtleties, and he wanted to make sure that every customer got the right meaning out of every ad they ever read. So I bet we have questions. I see questions. I see hands raised. We have two microphones that are going to move around. Bill and Evan have them. I see Simon's hand up in the front, and that's probably going to start a whole torrent of questions. Thanks, hi. Um, so I totally buy into the, the simplicity thing, everything you're saying, but I'm wondering what you think about um, like Baroque architecture or Bach fugues or something, which uh, seem to me to be complex and have little details and all that sort of thing. How does that fit into your aesthetic? Uh, I didn't quite get part of that question. You're talking about music being a more complicated world? Well, so, so the design um, aesthetic for, for Apple, uh, you know, in your presentation, uh, you know, simple and clean, all, yes. all that stuff you've been talking about. Um, but if you look at the, um, uh, you know, the, the Palace of Versailles or something like that, and they're oh, right, right. hugely okay. detailed. And well, I, I guess I should, um, should have a disclaimer at the start of my talks, which is simplicity isn't, you know, the goal of every one and everything on Earth. I mean... Obviously, uh, the world of art, music, um, not everything is simple, Al although you could argue that some of the, you know, the songs that become hits have this simplicity, and that's what appeals to people. But um, I think the world would be a pretty boring place if everything was simple. So I think it's a question of, of keeping the things that are supposed to be simple, simple. And I think Apple has succeeded because they, they have learned to take very complicated things and make them desire, objects of desire, you know, even for people who, who didn't you know, lust after them before. I mean, uh, a lot of people I know who never liked technology at all can't part with their iPhone, you know, stuff like that. So I, I think you have to be wise with where you uh, apply your love of simplicity. <clears throat> oh, uh, you can okay, share it around, yes. Uh, question is, uh, let's, let's wait for the mic. I'm almost there. I'm almost there. Just to follow up with uh, that previous question, do you see simplicity as a cultural value? E well, cultural, like within Apple or the world? Uh, I mean, I do think it is part of the culture of Apple, and I think one of the great things, you know, someone, uh, or people ask what is um, Apple's real contribution to the world. I actually like to think of it as you just said, really, that 
um, more so than any one product. I think Apple, by the incredible success of its products, by reaching the tens of millions of people they have reached, um, they've sort of raised the awareness of the value of design and simplicity and functionality and, and beauty and all that kind of stuff. And I think um, everyone has sort of benefited from that. I think society as a, as a whole generally, you know, our values all change somewhat together. And um, I think Apple has been a major catalyst making people more aware. So you get more people demanding that kind of thing in their products. And because more people are demanding it, more companies are giving it to them. So I think the result is that there's an awful lot of movement towards simplicity and design that might not, I don't think would have been there if it wasn't for Apple's success. I think we would have gotten there ultimately, but Apple has certainly been a major force. So I have a quick question and then I'll pass the mic off. In terms of interacting with um, the Dells and the HPs of the world, they have to be looking at their corroding market share and the, the lack of innovation that's going on inside their company. They have to be looking at that and evaluating what are we doing wrong and do they see simplicity as a means for them to get better or are they just stuck in in the old ways in there? Um, I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say this out loud, um, but I actually got a, a, an email from Michael Dell uh, not too many months ago. The subject line was, great book, exclamation point, exclamation point. And I was like, oh my God, I thought he was going to kill me after I wrote what I wrote. But he did appreciate it, and he actually asked some of his marketing people to read it, and they've invited me in to go talk to them next month, and I'm kind of relishing that opportunity. <clears throat> But I think people do. In fact, when I was working with Dell and when I worked with Intel, I think the, the leader always gets up and says, we, we love what Apple does. They always use Apple as an example. And they want to do something similar. They want to have that kind of impact. And they, they always start from that place. And then that's when all those complexity issues start arising. And some person somewhere doesn't like that, so they change it for him. And then some guy in another country says, that doesn't work, so we're going to water it down a little bit more. And by the time it runs, it looks somewhat mediocre. So it really is a question of, of committing all of your, your energy and, and significant amounts of money to, to stick with it. And I think that was the amazing thing about Steve. I think he had the ability to intimidate people into doing what he wanted to do. Um, and he wouldn't ever settle for second best and that kind of thing. So he was able to start with something great and end with something great. And in most companies I've worked with, it just doesn't work that way. Can a team achieve simplicity? Uh, what do you mean? <laughs> well, so yeah. we look at Steve Jobs as a powerful Right, oh, I see. Okay. But if you take a team of collaborators. Yeah. Can they achieve that kind of simplicity? I do think. And, and the beauty of what you guys do is I, most of you probably have small companies and, and you're not um, you know, cluttered with all the things that go on inside of Dell or an Intel. And again, I think the great thing that happened to Steve is that he, he loved those values and he held on to them even as Apple got bigger and bigger and bigger. So you, know, you guys should all take the pledge and promise to do the same. Um, but I think small groups of people can definitely achieve simplicity and meetings of the mind and, and all that. Um, it's just resisting all those forces that are going to try to make things less good. So does that level of simplicity require a certain leadership style that's very authoritative? Or do you think that there's a, a more consensus-based style that can achieve <clears throat> simplicity as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, obviously, a guy like Steve, um, was unique, and we're not going to see someone like him again, and most companies don't have someone like him. Although there are a lot of companies that have a powerful leader who can sort of change things by decree. Uh, so if someone like that has a thing about simplicity, you know, they can affect great change. Um, sometimes the leader of the company isn't that involved in day-to-day -day stuff, and there's someone else who can step in and do that. Um, and sometimes it's like a, a, a department. You're a manager of a department. You can sort of carve out your island of simplicity. But um, I get that question frequently about a, a, a personality-driven organization like Apple was with Steve versus a consensus-driven organization. And I'm sure there are examples of good consensus-driven groups. But um, you know, it's kind of like if you look around in politics, countries seem to 
do, well, not necessarily better, but at least they're united and they're not fighting amongst themselves you know, when there's one strong leader, whether he's a dictator or not. Um, but you know, you have like a Yugoslavia, and once the leader goes, they all start fighting amongst themselves. And actually at Dell, uh, that's what I experienced. All these different groups were competing, and, and they all had their, their own businesses, and they didn't really care. You know, the business guys didn't really care what the consumer guys were doing. And it was a way of working that just couldn't exist at Apple because everyone is there to serve the Apple brand, and the Apple brand just has different, different groups within. But they had you know, one vision unifying it all. So I don't know if I answered your question, but I mean, you, you can be successful both ways. It's just a question of whether the, the culture of the organization uh, understands and appreciates the power of simplicity. Quick. Wait a minute, wait a minute. He's coming, he's coming. Hey, hey. Question right here and then hey. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Oh, we'll, um, we'll come right back to you. It's, uh, it's kind of amazing how, you know, a decade ago, Microsoft was a big, scary company, and mostly through Apple's focus on simplicity, they've kind of reduced Microsoft's dominance. It seems like Microsoft finally realized that you look at products like Windows 8 and Windows Phone 8, and they are you know seem to be going much towards a, a more simple approach to their software. Do you think it's you know too late for Microsoft to become dominant again through mm -hmm. that approach, or do you think the sort of simplicity they're going for is actually honest and they're going to be able to you know, pull right. it off? Well, I would caution you to listen to too many things that I have to say <laughs> because I'm really not like a business expert. You know, I mean, I have the things that I believe in, the observations I've made. My personal belief is that, you know, Microsoft has failed in the most grotesque possible ways over the years. And I, for one, am stunned that Balmer could keep his job after missing the internet and missing the phones and missing the tablets. I mean, it's just like, how much more proof do you need? I've also always fantasized that, um, that a company with the incredible resources of, of Microsoft, if they had a real visionary leader, I would think they could be like the most amazing company on earth. So I, I, it, felt, it feels like a failed, you know, failed potential to me. Um, I kind of thought it was too little, too late. Um, <clears throat> I'm not always right, and I've seen some things that indicate Windows 8 may well get traction, and um, you know, with with rim on the ropes, you know, you never know, and it's interesting to watch, but I, I don't really have any uh, great insight on that one. Uh, I have a question over here. Uh, uh, hi. So I think. <laughs> kind of underlying the layer of simplicity, you also have the terms of the relationship that you've thought of with your user, and that even has a sense of place. And for those who try to uh, copy the, the Apple vision of simplicity, it seems like they fail because they miss the, um, almost the atmosphere of simplicity. Like Google Plus uh, was even led by some Apple talent, and to me, they really missed the mark because they didn't understand the the relationship um, that mingles with simplicity. Right. Do you have any comments about Google Plus? I was talking to someone about that before. Um, I'm not really a Google Plus person. You know, I, I, I sort of resist. I, I like new things, but I, for some reason, I didn't feel like getting involved. <laughs> so I, I'm actually a member, but I don't really do anything with it. Um, but I think you're absolutely right that it's all, all about, uh, again, with Apple, it's about getting people to love them and feel part of it and feel like, wow, those guys actually think like I think. And that, that's how you get people to love you is just, you know, if as a customer you think like, I share Apple's values, then you, you like them more and you stick with them. So if Google Plus you know, seem like, oh, wow, you know, they actually understand the way I'd like to do this better than Facebook, then, you know, you not only have a new customer, but someone who starts off liking you, and that's the key. But <clears throat> I'm not sure about the future of Google+. Plus. I mean, I keep hearing things, you know. Do you work with Google or anything? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> trying to tread lightly. Uh, yes, my man. Hey, Ken. Um, I don't know if I misheard Tim, but I thought I heard him mention that you had worked with Sade or you had, um, I don't know if you had written about her. About who? Sade. Did I miss Sade? Sade. 
Yeah, that's the ad agency. Got, got it. Got it. Never mind. I misheard then. Okay. No. Okay. Yeah. So, so I work for Shia. I'll, I'll forego my question. Okay. <laughs> Shia? Yeah. Sexy. So I had a question. Um, yeah. Uh, being that we're all software developers here, most of us are, um, in terms of like representing Apple's vision, ap Apple has hardware that it is being presented as very simple, but they kind of get out of the way and let us take over when you're using your iPad or something like that. So do we have a responsibility to maintain that simplicity like on the software layer to complete hmm. the vision of the experience, or could we screw that up, you yeah. know? Well, they won't. They won't really. Will they let you screw it up? Yeah. Well, I mean, in terms of like, you know, we can make overly complex apps. We right. could make non-simple apps. Right. You know, do Do we have a responsibility to maintain well, the ideal throughout? Yeah, the I think process? you do. You know, I think in the good old days, it was um, more visible when it was just a Macintosh, and the revolution of Macintosh. You know, aside from the well, part of the graphical interface was that oh wow, all apps work the same, and there's there's a file menu and a view menu and, you know, whatever. And once you, you know, I remember the ads used to say, you know, once you learn one Macintosh application, you can learn, you know, you know them all, basically. Um, that's changed, obviously, because apps look so different from one another now, you know, but they're all part of the same ecosystem. And I think, you know, to some degree, you're, you know, there's a similarity. No, not really. There's a lot, you know, because you take over the screen, you make it anything you want. You know, that's that's forgiven now. You don't have to have pull-down menus across the top and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's a lot more freedom now. But I think, I mean, most developers feel like they're part of an ecosystem, right? And there's there's certain rules you you are bound by, and and certainly apps that are simpler. Um, I mean, there, there's an obligation to to pay off the reason why people would prefer iOS. So, I mean, and, but you're right. I'm sure there are people who violate it all the time, and, and I don't know how popular their products, if, if they achieve popularity that way, but simplicity is always good. Yeah. Um, okay, Ken, I was, I was interested to hear your thoughts on um, using simplify, simplicity with branding and naming products, mm -hmm. because that to me has always been the problem with Microsoft, that you, you get the Microsoft Windows, blah, 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 Enterprise Edition for work groups. Right. You know? So I'm sorry, was there a question? I just wanted you to uh, hear something from you about oh, yeah. branding and naming. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I mentioned it when we were talking about those products and everything. I, I do think um, within Apple, there was always, you know, that was a big deal. The name had to be really, really good and, and make logical sense and when possible support the master brand and all that kind of thing. And it seems like in the world of, of uh, Dell, in particular HP, um, they don't really think that way. And and again, there are certain ways of thinking that, you know, if someone brought them before Steve Jobs, he would have, you know, had some kind of seizure. And <clears throat> um, it really is an important thing. It's part of branding. It's all, everything you do is supposed to build the brand in some way, shape, or form. And that's kind of like just a basic marketing thing. And um, it's just amazing how many big, well, they are successful. Companies don't pay attention to that. And it, it always boggles my mind when I see certain things. Just kind of a sloppy way to do branding, you know. Um, for a lot of people here that are doing like a, a new app or a new startup, first thing you do is look oh, for I'm a domain sorry. name uh, and try to find a unique do domain name. But what's also equally hard is trying to name your app because you have such limited text space. Yeah. Do you have any suggestions for? No. In fact, <laughs> knowing that I was coming here, I actually did a lot of looking around. I was thinking about doing a little bit on um, naming apps. And then I decided I uh, better not even bring it up. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I mean, it is all over the place, and you know, a good—it's like anything, like a good domain name. And just when you think everyone's been taken, someone comes up with you know a really good one. You go like, man, they got so lucky. Um, you know, I always used to fear that um, we're going to run out of original music because all the notes will be arranged on the pages and in so many possible ways. You know, how could you write anything original anymore? And yet people keep thinking of new ways to do it. So. Um, I know it's difficult. Uh, every time I get involved with a project and have to find a domain name, it's like next to impossible. But you know, at some point we find something. It's just <clears throat> maybe one day we'll have a true crisis. But until then, you know, it's always out there to be found. 
uh, I don't, you know, there's no magic advice I could give you, obviously. It's all about <clears throat> trying to, uh, you know, something that's memorable, captures the spirit of the app or the game or whatever. It's tough. That's why they people pay people big bucks to come up with names like that. <clears throat> Hi. Um, I really loved the Think Different ad campaign. It was amazing. And I could watch that ad over and over again. Um, it used to be that when I was you know, watching TV, we've got the PVR and you skip through commercials. Oh, there's an Apple commercial. Let me watch it, right? Because I loved them, the, the, uh, the PC versus Mac, Mac ads. PC, yeah. What do you think of the current set of ad campaigns that they're running these days? Because I, I mean, I've seen them. They're not very exciting. <clears throat> They just don't feel Apple-like to me right now, and maybe you could right. go in and help them fix it up. <laughs> get, get the entertainment back in the ads and, right. and really send that message across that Apple <clears throat> is awesome, and because they are. Well, this is the point where I start making even more enemies from where I, where I came from, but um, I've always thought that iPhone app, uh, iPhone ads were a good example. When they first came out, they wanted to educate people. So it was the hand holding an iPhone. It would be, you can run this app and that app and that app. And they started telling stories about you know a mom going out with a family, and she did this on the phone, did this on the phone, did that on the phone, stuff like that. Um, and they were interesting. You know, They kind of told the story because you had to educate people what was so good about an iPhone. But they did that for like three years. And I, I you know, it was one of the rules, well, not really a rule, but a lot of People say things like, if that's on the TV, um, you know, if, if the sound isn't up, they all, you wouldn't know it was a new commercial even. It's like, oh, there's another hand holding an iPhone. So, you know, sometimes you see something and then you, you stop everything and turn on the sound. Like with Mac versus PC, I thought it was a fantastic campaign because it changed visually so drastically, you know, like the guy being blown up and all that kind of stuff. And, um, if you had the sound off, you'd see a new one of those ads and you'd go like, oh, oh, it's a new one, and you'd, and you'd want to watch it. So they kind of, I mean, and hate to say it, but Steve Jobs was guilty of this. Um, when something's working, sometimes you don't want to change it. And I think iPhone was such a big success, nobody wanted to change it. And then when iPad came out, they kind of did the same thing. It was like an iPad, you know, on people's laps or whatever, but it's like, here's what it does, here's what it does, here's what it does. I kept wishing they would do something really different. Um, and the, the one, it kind of came to a head for me when they did the genius campaign that was on the Olympics with, with the you know, bad Apple genius. Because then it got into the realm of embarrassing. And uh, I mean, everyone I hung out with was like, holy cow, what the heck is going on there? <laughs> it was like, you know, it was like a Best Buy ad. It was just, it wasn't funny. Um, and it seemed to kind of go against the basic universal truth of Apple products, which is they're so easy to use, you don't need help, really. It was about ordinary people doing extraordinary things. And suddenly, each commercial was about some guy panicking because he doesn't know how to use his iPhone or whatever, and he needs an expert to help him. So it seemed to actually be contrary to the, the golden rule. Um, fortunately, though, they realized quickly there was an uproar. And, and I actually thought it was kind of funny. They used to leave the ads on their website for a while, and they were taken down they were taken off the YouTube channel. It was like all six weeks after they ran, every trace of those commercials was removed. Uh, people who had posted them independently as private people on YouTube found that they had copyright notices and they were yanked. They're literally nowhere to be found, except on my computer, because I downloaded them when nobody was looking. <laughs> <clears throat> I have the evidence, they'll never get me. Um, but the only reason I bring that up too is because e people ask me, like, is it all over? You know, it's like first big campaign since Steve died, and look how terrible it is. The end is near. But you know, we did some bad ads, and um, everyone who tries to do great ads fails now and then. That's part of you know when you work with a company like Apple that allows you to take chances, they don't always work. Um, so what I said to people at the time was, you know, if they do two in a row like that, I'd start worrying. But right now, I'm not all that worried. And indeed, the next campaign that came was the uh, iPhone ads with, um, what's his name? Jeff Daniels. Um, and the first batch of those, I thought, were, was just really, really good. I mean, the voice was like really interesting. And they had you know, the thing about taking the, uh, the panoramic shot of the kids in costumes and all that kind of stuff. It was just really interesting, I thought. Um, so I was like, yes, they're back. 
Um, and they've done a few since, and I've heard some people grumbling they're not, not that good anymore, <laughs> so it always changes. But I think Apple has a, it's part of their culture to do interesting ads, and that will go on. But I think they also sometimes rest on their laurels a bit too much. And when you're the leader, you actually have more freedom, I think, to, to go out on a limb and try something fresh and new. Um, and that's why I get disturbed when Apple, as the leader, does, you know, when they kind of just start coasting. So <clears throat> it'll be interesting to see without Steve where it goes in the future, though, because he was in every meeting and he approved every word and every picture. <clears throat> yes? Um, so looking back in hindsight, iPad is it, it, it's such a perfectly named product. Uh, but I, I remember in, like, January 2010, before, before it came out, there's a lot of rumors about what it might be called. If right. It was going to be, like, the Slate. Exactly. And then CES happened, and... Walmart announced Slate tablets or Slate computing. Do you have any thoughts on that about what yeah, was actually, it purposely kind of um, dropped? I don't know about that. I mean, I, I think I even wrote a blog article about, you know, I was doing the guessing thing like everybody else. And I had, my thing was, um, I, was I was worried about the eye. I wasn't worried because I actually I had a conversation with Steve um, in somewhat recent history about the eye. And he he thought it was sort of running its course. And I thought that um, actually one reason he, he, interesting point he made was that, you know, technically we've got Mac, MacBook and MacBook Pro. Technically we should have Mac and Mac Pro. But we can't call the iMac Mac because every Mac is called a Mac. <laughs> so if someone came into the store and said, a friend of mine told me I should get a Mac, it would be like, well, do you mean like any old Mac or like the Mac? <laughs> so it would get too confusing. So he said, we're stuck with the eye, you know? And I thought when the iPad came out that it might be called Slate. There was another name, I forget, there was a popular rumor. But the article I wrote was that, you know, if it's not an eye thing, then the end is near, you know, the eyes are being phased out. But if it is an eye thing, prepare for several generations <laughs> of eye things because there'll be no escape. Um, and indeed it was an eye thing, so now, it's really hard to imagine it ever being anything else. But I don't know, you know, your question about whether HP or Microsoft sort of aced out Apple. I, I think it would have been an I thing anyway. So I think that's another example of, you know, coasting to a degree, but it's like really successful and it's, it's a strong Apple branding element. And I'm not sure if I would recommend walking away from it. It's, a, it's got a lot of value. <clears throat> yes. I was wondering if you had any examples of uh, maybe a time where something was oversimplified and a key element was a complexity and therefore left out, but it turned out to be important. Hmm. Interesting question. No, there was never such a time. <laughs> uh, Nothing comes to mind. I mean, you know, we had some failures. You know, the Cube was a, was a great failure. Um, the Power Mac G4 Cube that Steve was very keen on. And, and I remember the day we had a meeting with him. He came into the room. He looked like somebody had just died. He was, like, pale, and he was just, like, shaken because he said he just had this meeting with the um, manufacturing people, and they could not get the price below seventeen ninety nine. And he said... He really wanted it to be 1499. Um, it had to be within the, you know, the realm of possibility for a high-end consumer because at 1799, it's going to have to be a pro product and it's going to die. And amazingly, you know, within a year, it was gone. But he was really, really sad. But it wasn't a question of oversimplification, so I didn't really answer your question. <laughs> but I appeared to. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yes. Hey, Ken. Um, as we're all iOS developers and believers and things like that, we see consistent numbers with uh, iOS's market share depleting, especially when it comes to browsing and things like that. Do you think there's something that Apple can do to prevent that, or is this just other players coming to the game, late to the game, that are slowly gaining a little bit of traction? And does that result in anything you know, that will severely affect the iOS market? Would you repeat the very first part of that, that who's coming in? Like the Android, you mean getting well, yeah, more market you, share? You see Android, they've increased their market share. I right, mean, right. Th- there's a bazillion devices, right? Right, right. And I don't know, actually, off the top of my head, if any of the other numbers. I think, actually, right. everyone else is falling. <clears throat> but yeah. I, no, I mean, I'm not a developer, and I keep 
abreast of certain things, read articles, and I do, you know, the ones I read, maybe they're from the pro Apple side, but about how, you know, iOS developers make more money, and, you know, there's all kinds of fragmentation, horrible problems, and whatever, but um, it is, I mean, it's a curious thing, you know, Apple stock taking a beating now because all these rumors, you know, Samsung is this and that. Um, you know, nothing lasts forever. I always tell people that, um, you know, you can be sitting on top of the world. I mean, yeah, it's just an absolute fact that nobody is going to be the leader forever. And the question is, when does the end come? When does somebody, when does somebody surpass Apple and iOS? And, you know, when, when does it not become the best place to be? It could be a month from now or it could be 40 years from now. I mean, it's really, it's hard to tell. Um, I mean, I, my personal thing is that because Apple has created, uh, you know, and I do believe that people make more money, the higher quality, and there's more consistency and all that kind of stuff. Um, it seems like it's an advantage that will hold for a while, but uh, the world is a crazy place and people are actually buying these other things, so. Doom. Yes. There's a, as you mentioned and talked uh, and in your book, uh, there's a lot of valuable lessons we can learn from Steve. But is, are there some lessons that people draw from Steve that you wish they would not have? You know, things, I mean, I know there's things that we all know. He's not perfect, right? He had some flaws. Yeah. And they're kind of, the obvious ones are obvious. But are there some things that are people are taking from him that they shouldn't? Or his style or his, philo you know, what they perceive well, to be his philosophy, right. perhaps? I think the, the good thing is most people, I think it's well documented that he could be really brutal and all that kind of stuff. Um, and I, I don't think anyone actually sets out to emulate that. They try to take the good from him and still be, you know, good human beings. Um, and then we happen to know people who are jerks who w would have been jerks without Steve, you know. So, um, yeah, but I, I do think, I mean, I think there's an awful lot to learn from him. You know, the Isaacson book, um, I thought was a, you know, a bit much on the on the brutal side. It made him sound like just a horrible, horrible person. My own assessment was that he was like 50-50. I mean, when you were doing, when he liked your work, he was fun and charismatic and interesting, and you know, and you really wanted to please him. And he was, and he was fun, um, he, and he was human. He cared about doing good in the world, but he, his way of getting there was, you know, his passion drove him. And when you got in the way of his passion, then that's when he would explode. But I think I don't know. He's a pretty well documented guy now, and I think. Um, People, I trust people to take the good lessons and try to, you know, have his good without the bad. By the way, I work right now, do a lot of work with Ron Johnson, you know, the guy who started the Apple stores. I'm working with him on J.C. JCPenney. Uh, we did the Ellen DeGeneres commercials that were on the Oscars last year, which were kind of fun. Uh, we're working on a new campaign that will debut on this year's Oscars without Ellen. Um, but Ron is an interesting guy because he is very much like Steve, I think, in his vision and his determination. He's really smart, He's a, uh, but he's a really, really nice guy, too. He hugs me at the start of meetings. <laughs> um, no, he's just a really good guy to work with. Um, he hugs everybody, it's not just me. Um, he's a good moral person who wants to do, he wants to reinvent the department store. He thinks it's, it's you know, what they are now is just has no future, and he wants to create the new kind of department store. And, um, just in case, I'm going off on a tangent here, but in case anyone is doubting because they've lost hundreds of millions of dollars in recent quarters, um, there's a prototype store in Texas, like they did the prototype of the Apple store, um, top secret location. <clears throat> Actually, it's in a shopping mall there that any, hundreds of people go to every day, but uh, it's a secret floor there. Um, and if you saw the J.C. Penney that he's planning, you would you would die. I mean, it's like. It's like one of the greatest stores I've ever been in. It's really cool. The problem is there are 1,100 stores, and it's going to take them two, three years to, you know, they're doing pieces inside every store, and you see like a shop here and a shop there, but it's going to all be like shops, like all these cool brands. And um, anyway, the whole thing sort of comes to, starts getting more visible this year. So it's a good time to buy stock. Quite depressed now all right. after I bought it, of course. Ken, one more last question over here. Yeah. Mine's really just a follow-up to the last question, um, it, but said a different way. Um, I, I read your book, very, very good book. Um, I, it felt like it was the biography in a lot of ways that Jobs deserved, even though I know that wasn't your purpose. 
Um, there were a lot of stories you talked about. You, you talked about the good in, in some of the meetings where you went in, and uh, there was this great story where you talked about you came in with three ideas, and um, one of the concepts, the team busted their butt, and in your mind, you knew it wasn't a good idea, or, or it wasn't as good as the other two, and you brought it in, and immediately Jobs pointed out and said, this isn't worth it, don't, yeah. you know, you put the B team His exact on. words were, you brought in the B team, yeah. I see. A fanta fantastic story, and, and my question about that is, you, you talked a lot about it, and you were very, you were very praiseful of Jobs, that you felt like he taught you a lot, and he made you better. Is that something you knew immediately when you were walking out of that meeting, or is that something that it took years later? Mm -hmm. And I guess my question around it is, I'm a business owner. I have you know, a lot of developers that work for me. What is the appropriate, I want to drive them. I want them to be better. I have very talented people working for me. How do I make them better? Right. And jobs seemed effective at that, but at the same time, you don't want to destroy morale. So how, yeah. I guess my question mm -hmm. is, how long did it take to recover from a meeting like that did you know immediately, or was oh. it something, you know, you're writing this 20 years later? Well, that, that one I did know immediately because I didn't think that particular bit of work was really of the caliber that we should go in with. But, again, the people worked their guts, you know, out and tried to, that's not an expression, they worked hard. Um, and they, whatever, so I did it, and he called me on it. And that was one of those things where you just go like, okay, never again. <laughs> I'm not going to be that nice a guy to those people. But, you know, I didn't go in there and, Start acting brutal myself. Try to cajole, you know, better better work out of them and explain what had happened. Said, you know, Steve said it wasn't really worthy, and um, you know, try to learn from it. But it's it's hard because you're dealing with people's feelings. And um, Steve's advantage was that he didn't care a bit how you felt. <laughs> he would just say what's on his mind. And um, most of us don't have that ability, and it's a good thing, or we'd all hate each other. <laughs> um, so, so Ken, just yeah. to close since we're getting short on time. Right. What, um, the final word, what excites you the most about the future? The future in, in general technology. or the future with Apple? The future in technology and our lives and oh, okay. I, everything. Um, well, you know, we all do this thing about like what could possibly be next and at some point, it's like, well, they can't really do anything more. Processors aren't getting that much faster. Software is kind of as good as it's going to get. And then someone always manages to, to blow it all up and do something that's amazingly great again. And so I kind of stopped thinking that. I used to think that, like, you know, we're, we're slowing down now. But, um, you know, the world, it's like things just keep happening until, uh, so I'm very, I'm excited to be part of the business. And... You never know where the next cool thing is going to come from, which is why, you know, groups like this are so interesting because, you know, these ideas are just floating around and they, you never know what's going to create the next revolution. So I'm, I'm always, I'm just a hopeful guy in general. I don't like to think bad thoughts. So Thank I'm you. excited. All right. Thanks. Thanks, everyone. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.